You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. With your Bible open to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, let's bow to the Lord before we begin our study. Our gracious and merciful God, we are thankful for your word that it addresses all the concerns of our life and gives us everything that we need for life and for godliness. And there's nothing new under the sun. There is no new doctrine. There is no philosophy of man that is new. Nothing has been invented that is new by way of a fallen man's thinking. And so we just pray that you would give us grace now to understand the thinking of fallen men and to evaluate it from the biblical perspective of your truth. We ask your blessing upon this time and your word be communicated clearly for we believe that when your word is properly preached then your voice is truly heard. And may that be the case here amongst us this morning as we read, study, and obey your word. In Christ's name, amen. In 1971, John Lennon wrote a song that has worked its way and remained in the consciousness of our nation. And it is a song that is an anthem to atheistic humanism and secularism and globalism and socialism. And it's a memorable song. It's one of those songs that once it gets in your mind, you have a hard time getting it out of your mind. And it gets into my head and I find myself humming it and hating it both at the same time because the words are so antithetical to all things biblical. And just by the description of that song, you probably can well imagine what song I'm talking about, right? It's the song Imagine. And it has worked its way not only into the consciousness of America, but it seems to have become something of a global, uh, a globally recognized uh, thing as well. I don't know if you remember this, but back in the 2012, in the closing ceremonies of the Olympics, Summer Olympics in London, they sang that song at the end of the closing ceremonies, or part of the closing ceremonies, sung by a, a children's choir. Because nothing says adorable and cute like a bunch of children singing an anthem to secular, atheistic, globalistic, socialistic humanism and lauding the praises of a worldview that has cost literally hundreds of millions of lives when it is implemented. It's just so adorable, isn't it? And there's something of an irony in the fact that they sang that song as part of the closing ceremony of the Olympics, because the second verse of that song begins with, Imagine there are no countries. Imagine there are no countries. You just, you just had a massive event that was all about countries. Nobody can walk out without somebody talking about their country, and we tally up the medals that are earned by individual countries, and we all compete one country against another. And we sing the anthem to every country that wins a gold medal as part of the ceremony. It is all about countries. Imagine there are no countries. Didn't anybody realize that if we actually lived in a world with no countries, there would be no Olympics? We wouldn't have any Olympics, would we? This would be like the NFL at the end of the Super Bowl singing the song, Imagine There Are No Football Teams. And we would all stand around and look at that and say, how ridiculous and stupid is that? Or the Texas Cattlemen and Ranchers Association singing a song at the end of their annual meeting, lauding the glories of vegetarianism and veganism. We would all think that that was stupid and ludicrous, and it truly is. But it's not the second verse of that song, which really pertains to what I want to talk about today. It's the first one, whose lyrics are probably far more memorable to you than the second. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, uh, below us, and above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Eh, eh, eh. Yeah. <laughs> and I promise I won't do that again. <clears throat> so imagine there's no heaven. I just want to break this down for just a second because there's nothing new about this worldview. Imagine there is no heaven. Now, by the way, you only have to imagine things that are not so. The fact that you have to imagine there is no heaven is an implicit acknowledgement that you understand that there is a heaven, right? We don't have to imagine things that are not so. We only have to imagine things that we know are not actually uh, real. So when he says imagine there's no heaven, it's actually an admission that he believes that there is a heaven and acknowledges that there is one. I mean, we don't have to imagine things that aren't. We don't have to imagine that fire is hot. We don't have to imagine that water is wet. We don't have to imagine that the patriots cheat. These things just are. Okay, they just exist, they are what they are, and we all acknowledge them as reality. We don't have to imagine these things because they are true. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. So that's what he's trying to imagine. No hell below us and above us only sky. In other words, imagine a world in which 
there is no eternal judgment and no eternal reward. No consequences for evil behavior. No rewards for good behavior. No final reckoning. Imagine a world in which there is no moral difference between a man who gasses six million Jews and a man who spends his life serving the poor. Imagine a world in which there is no moral weightiness in difference between a difference in moral weightiness between those two things. Imagine a world in which there is no thought of future judgment or reconciliation, no thought of any kind of accountability. There's no reward. There's no afterlife. Imagine all the people living for today. What a great world that would be, would it not? If we all just lived for the day, gave no thought of what might happen tomorrow or what the consequences of our actions would be, if every person on the planet lived today as if this were their last day and they were going to give it all of their, their gusto, go for the gold, go for broke, and just have everything that you can today, imagine such a world. Does that sound like utopia to you? Yeah, John Lennon, not to be confused with Vladimir Lennon, though there are similarities in their worldview, obviously, John Lennon thought that this was the path to utopia, to the true brotherhood of man, to true meaning and significance. John Lennon believed that all meaning and significance could be found in this world from under the sun. If we were to take, because there's nothing new about uh, Lennon's worldview, if we were to take his worldview and put it in Solomon's language, it would be, imagine life under the sun. That This is all there is. Nothing below this turf, but more turf. Nothing above us but sky and the sun. And nothing outside of that. No moral accountability, no moral truth, no divine wisdom, no divine revelation, no divine purpose given to us by God, no thought to what the Creator has put us here for, no thought as to anything in the future, all of humanity just living for today as if today is all that I have, so I will eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow I die. That's the worldview. Imagine such a worldview. Now, we don't have to imagine what it is like to live in a worldview where we imagine that there is no heaven because Solomon tried it and he experimented with it and he wrote about the implications of it and the, the, the result of such thinking in the book of Ecclesiastes. And that's what we're studying now. We're looking today in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Last week I gave you a, an, an overview of the book of Ecclesiastes. We dealt with some of the interpretive difficulties and some of the apparent contradictions in the book. And um, I, I, I told you that much of the perspective of Solomon, we have to understand the perspective of Solomon if we are going to understand and interpret Ecclesiastes correctly. And there are different words and phrases that Solomon uses that communicates his, uh, his perspective from which he is writing and from which we have to interpret Ecclesiastes. One of those is the word vanity, which occurs 38 times in this book. And we're going to talk about today what that word means and its significance. The other phrase is under the sun, which occurs 29 times. The word labor occurs 25 times. The word work is mentioned 12. Toil is mentioned 6. That's combined for labor, work, and toil 43 times. Those are mentioned in the book of Ecclesiastes. And the word man is seen 70 times in this short book. 70 times. So that's the perspective from which Solomon is writing this. And and we're going to be looking at verses 2 and 3 today, which give us two of those phrases, the word vanity and the phrase under the sun. And we're going slow still a little bit here in the beginning because I'm still laying some groundwork and we need to kind of flesh out some of these details and we will pick it up in the next several weeks. And I tell you that only because I don't want you to be thinking to yourself, Okay, John was 21 chapters and we spent seven years in John. Ecclesiastes is half that long, so that's... Well, I wasn't homeschooled, so I can't do that kind of math, but it's a long time. And I don't want you to be thinking that. We're going to pick it up, pick up the pace in a little bit in the next few weeks, but we're still kind of laying the groundwork looking at Solomon's perspective in verses 2 and 3. So read those two verses together. Verse 2 is a declaration of vanity. Verse 2, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What advantage does man have in all his work which he does under the sun? Now, verse 2, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That is repeated at the end of the book in chapter 12, verse 8. And uh, that sort of sets the stage for all that is to follow. He is, he is leading up to more that is in this book that he is going to describe to us uh, as vain and filled with vanity. It is repeated almost word for word in chapter 12, verse 8. And so this statement at the beginning of the book and the statement at the end of the book, they kind of serve as bookends. It's like the front and the back cover of the book of Ecclesiastes. And everything in between is an explanation of what a, a vain and godless worldview looks like. What does the word vanity mean? If you have any translation, um, if you have any of the modern translations other than the NIV, it translates it as vanity. The NIV has a bit of a different translation there. The NIV says meaningless, meaninglessness, 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 says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. 
And what the NIV is trying to do is capture the idea of vanity, which doesn't quite come out in our English translation, because when you and I think of vanity, typically we don't think of something that is empty and meaningless. When we think of something that is vain or something that is vanity, we're thinking in terms of conceit, right? An overestimation of your abilities, your qualities, your good looks, or your talents, or your intellect, or whatever it is. And and that's kind of a, a, a senseless pride in those things. And we think of somebody who is, is proud and conceited and self-directed. That's what we think of in terms of vanity. But that's not the idea of vanity that Solomon is, is talking about. When Solomon is talking about this word, he, he kind of, when he uses this word, he's describing something else that our English word also captures. And that is the idea of something that is devoid of any substance or value or worth. It is empty, it is useless, and it is meaningless. And the word is often translated in that way. It's, it's the Hebrew word havel. And it is translated sometimes as temporary, transitory, meaningless, senseless, futile, contingent, incomprehensible, incongruous, absurd, empty, striving after wind, mist, and even breath. Mist and even breath. And it, it is the, it is the idea of a breath. In fact, it is a very breathy word. When you say the word havel in Hebrew, you actually have to aspirate, breathe out two times in order to say the word. And it's an onomatopoetic word. Now, that's a big word that I didn't learn in public school. But that word means that that word sounds like what it means. The meaning is very much like the sound of it. So an onomatopoetic word is like our word, English word, quack or bark or bang. Those words, those words mean what they sound like in saying them. And havel in Hebrew, when you pronounce it that way, it's two breaths of hell. And you actually have to breathe out as you're saying it. And so even in the pr- pronouncing of the word, you get an idea as to its meaning and substance. So what is there left in a breath when you breathe it out? You can't grab that, can you? And how long did that last? Not very long. And, and it's gone. It's, the, the instant it leaves my, my mouth, the breath dissipates. There's no substance to it. There's really no meaning, meaning in it. it. It is completely insignificant. You can't grasp it because there's nothing to it. So it is completely meaningless and empty. And that is how the word is used. Like as in Psalm 39, verses 4 through 6. Lord, make me to know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as handbreadths and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere vanity, a mere breath. And that's the idea of something being transitory and and, and passing very quickly and being filled with nothingness. That's the idea behind that word. So when you say that something is vain in the sense that Solomon is using it, we're describing something that is is can vanish in an instant, something that is meaningless, or something that is very mysterious. And Solomon seems to use this word, Havel, in that sense all the way through the book of Ecclesiastes. And every time he uses it, we have to get some idea of, of, of the context because he uses it in different ways throughout the book because there's kind of a, a wide range of meaning. But in this context, when he says vanity of vanities, he is, he is speaking of the meaninglessness and the emptiness of what he is going to spend 11 chapters describing. It is utterly meaningless. It is utterly empty. And I don't want to depress you, and this is why I told you at the beginning, we're not going to spend three years on this book. I don't want to depress you by reminding you again of how empty everything is, but remember that Solomon is describing this from the vantage point of life under the sun. It's, it's, this is life. This is, he is describing life as he sees it, without any divine vantage point or perspective involved at all. It's just life under the sun, which he mentions in verse 3. Philip Ryken says of this, this word, translated vanity, taken literally, the Hebrew word havel refers to a breath or vapor, like a puff of smoke rising from a fire, or uh, the cloud of steam that comes from hot breath on a frosty morning. How long does that last? How substance is You can actually see it, right? But there's really nothing to it. Life is like that, he says. It is elusive, ephemeral, and enigmatic. Life is so insubstantial that when we try to get our hands onto it, it slips right through our fingers. Half of the times that the word Havel occurs in the Old Testament, it is used in the book of Ecclesiastes. Half of the times. It's 35, over 35 times. Thirteen times the word is used to describe idols in the Old Testament. And it speaks there of the meaninglessness and the emptiness and the futility, the powerlessness of idols to do anything. They are vain. They are useless. They are transitory. They don't actually exist. They only exist in form and in thought. But these are not real things. These are not real gods. That's the idea behind it. Completely empty and completely useless. So what Solomon does now when he says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He's doing three things here. First, notice how he intensifies it by saying, not just saying it is vain or it is vanity, 
But he says it is vanity of vanities. And that's a form of language in the Hebrew Old Testament that is used from time and uh, time and again in the Old Testament. And it has the idea of taking something and ratcheting it up to the highest or greatest level of that thing. So, for instance, when we talk of of Christ being the king of kings, we are saying that of all the kings, he is the king of kings, right? He's not just king among kings. He's the king of kings. Or the God of gods. It's not that our God exists as one alongside of a pantheon of other gods, but rather our God is the God over and above all gods. None of these other gods exist. They are all worthless because our God is the God of gods. Solomon does it in the Song of Songs. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1, refers to the Song of Solomon as the Song of Songs. And that's Solomon's way of saying, it's not just another song among songs. This is the Song of Songs. This is the greatest and the best and the most glorious, the most majestic, the highest song out of all of the songs. We say that Jesus is the Lord of Lords. What do we mean? He's the highest and the greatest. This is used, the heaven of heavens. It's used constantly in the, in, in the, in the Bible to describe among those things which are like that, this is the thing which is above all of that. So here's what Solomon is saying. Imagine all of the emptiness and the futility and the vanity and the uselessness of life and the meaninglessness of it. There is one thing that is vanity of all of those vanities. <laughs> this is Everything is not just vanity, but it's actually vanity of vanities. He intensifies it. And the second, he repeats it. It's not as if it's not acceptable for him to just say at one time, vanity of vanities. No, no. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. He repeats it, in case you didn't catch it the first time. And then he includes everything in that description. All is vanity. All people, all places, all purposes, all activities, all endeavors, all accomplishments, all gold medals, all silver medals, all bronze medals, all recognition, all popularity, everything is vanity of vanities. Now, when you listen to that, I hope that you taste the ashes in your mouth. Because that's, that's what it should feel like. Do you feel the burden of that curse? Vanity of vanities. It is all useless and utter futility. And everything that we have and everything that we do, apart from God, is that vanity of vanities. Now, Solomon, in, in, in saying this at the beginning of the book, he is, he is slapping us up, up alongside of the face with this reality. Wake up. This is what you have to know about everything. It's all vain. It's all empty. It's all meaningless. Keep in mind, he's not judging these things from the perspective of God. He's judging these things from the perspective of life under the sun. And some people have to be slapped in the face with the uselessness of all things before they can ever see the usefulness of anything or the meaningfulness of anything. Sometimes they have to get, as Solomon did, to the very end of his rope and be able to say that it is all vanity before he can ever conclude that anything is not vanity. Because it is only when God is there that anything makes sense. Because without God, everything is vanity. So this is, Solomon is setting us up to show to us that no matter what he pursued, whether it was, whether it was women or whether it was wine or whether it was wisdom, or building, or popularity, or fame, or power, or the office of a king, no matter what it was that was in his life. And this was a man who had everything that there was to have. No matter what it was, apart from God, it was complete emptiness, completely useless, completely futile, and completely meaningless. In other words, if all that is under the sun is everything, then everything under the sun is nothing. You catch that? If all that is under the sun is everything that there is, if there's nothing above it, there's nothing beyond this creation, nothing transcendent, if all that is under the sun is everything, then everything under the sun is nothing. Then it's all meaningless. But if God exists, then there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a final judgment, there is meaning, there is purpose, there is truth, there is significance, not just to some things, but to everything. See, it's an all or nothing proposition. You take God out of it, everything is meaningless. There is nothing meaningful. Morality is, has no significance. Because morality is just pegged to whatever you deem to be best or right for you in this circumstance at this time. And if you think beating and abusing little children is the right and the best thing for culture and society, who is to say that you are wrong? Because all you have is your own personal preferences, not really tr- any truly objective moral standard. So you take God out of the equation and education is meaningless, your career is meaningless, your marriage is meaningless, your, the things that you do with your day is meaningless, all your activity, everything under the sun, it's all meaningless. But put God into it and nothing is meaningless. Suddenly everything is significant. 
Suffering is significant. Pain is significant. The work that you do is significant. Your marriage is significant. What you do with your children is significant. What you do in your entertainment is significant. Even what you, every, every idle word that you say is significant. And everything that you do with every idle moment of your day, all of it has significance and meaning if God is in the equation. But if God is not in the equation, then nothing is significant. It is an all or nothing proposition. Everything is vanity. It is all emptiness and vain when viewed from verse three from the perspective of under the sun. So that's the declaration first that everything is vain because if everything, if everything under the sun is everything, if under the sun is everything, then everything under the sun is really nothing. Now look at what Solomon does in questioning an advantage in verse three. What advantage does man have in all his work which he does under the sun? What's the advantage or what's the profit? Now this, this question is inseparably linked to verse two. Because everything is meaningless and empty. You're viewing it from under the sun. If everything is meaningless and empty, then the only question that should concern us is, what do I need to do to get what is best for me? What advantage does man have in all of his labor under the sun? Is there any profit then to anything that I do? If everything is meaningless, then is there any profit to all of my labor and toil? And the word advantage there is sometimes translated as as profit because that's the idea it actually refers to literally to first something that is left over so you have your your gain you have your expenses you subtract your expenses from your gain and you have your advantage or your profit from your activities or your labors and that's the word that is used what then is the profit or advantage to a man for any or all of his work which he does under the sun and the word work there or labor toil however your translation renders it it's not it's not a happy word for work. It actually refers to hard work, to misery, to the drudgery, to the vexing, taxing toil of work and labor. It's not the type of work where you grab your pickaxe in the morning and you hop in line with the rest of the dwarfs and you sing and whistle all the way to the mine shaft each and every morning. Not that type of work. But the type of work where you wake up on some Monday morning and you think, oh, it's 6 o'clock. i got five days of this in a row. And I hate every last minute of it. Completely useless. These people don't appreciate me. These people don't pay me enough. I'm going to be away from my family, and there's nothing that I, there's nothing that I gain out of this or get from this. And you do this five days in a row, only to look forward to Friday, so that you have two uninterrupted days of being able to do what you want to do. And they're two joyous and happy and glorious days. But then Monday morning comes, and it's back to the drudgery, the grindstone, the vexing, exhausting pathetic uselessness of those five solid days. That's the idea behind that translation. That word is translated work. What does man get? What advantage is there for his work which he does under the sun? Because you see, if everything is if everything is vain, then you must go on this search for what is advantageous or profitable. Because that's what you have to have then. If everything is useful, then I've, I've got to find some advantage then that at least is advantage to me for all that I do, all my work and toil. And Solomon really in this book, Ecclesiastes, is on a quest for advantage. And he, he returns to this theme throughout the book. Let me give you a couple of examples. Chapter 3, verse 19 says, For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast, for all is vanity. Notice the connection between advantage and vanity again. There's no advantage for man over beast because everything is vain. So once everything is admitted that it's useless, that there's no meaning in it, then there's no advantage that a man has over a mere animal in any of his endeavors. Ecclesiastes 5.11, when good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage of their owners except to look on? Ecclesiastes 5.16, this also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Notice the question again advantage to my toil and toiling after what the wind it's that van- the idea of vanity again ecclesiastes 6 8 for what advantage does the wise man have over the fool what advantage does the poor man have knowing how to walk before the living ecclesiastes 6 11 for there are many words which increase futility what then is the advantage to a man this is the necessary question and we're forced to ask this question if everything's useless what do i get out of my work there truly is then no advantage to a man. If there is no heaven and there is no hell and we remove God from the perspective, then tell me what advantage does the righteous have over the wicked? None. What advantage does a wise man have over the poor? None. Nothing of eternal significance. And this is why Solomon is 
after this quest for advantage. Is it better to be wise or a fool? Righteous or wicked? Young or old? Smart or dumb? A king or a peasant? Uh, wealthy or poor? Which is more advantageous to me? Because when you remove God from the perspective, then all we have is what I can get for me under the sun. And this is the culture in which we live. We have a nation that has rejected objective truth. It has rejected morality. It lives and teaches all of our children in our education and our entertainment that there is no God, there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no moral accountability. Everything's relative. Nothing is necessarily true. Nothing is necessarily false. Nothing is necessarily good. Nothing is necessarily evil. There is no objective standard. And so you remove God out of all of that perspective. And without even teaching people to do so, the logical conclusion of that is then, then it is all uselessness and meaninglessness and there is no advantage of me over a beast. And so I will live as I please and do as I please in order to gain me advantage right now in this moment. And so I will live for today. Hey, hey. Okay. That's the worldview. And I promised I wouldn't do that. I promise you I won't do it again. But that's the worldview. We're just going to live for today. So if everything is vain, if everything is empty, then truly there is no advantage under the sun. And there's something of a, of a self-refuting logic here in even Solomon asking the question. And I want you to notice this. Uh, it's self-refuting in this sense. It's kind of like somebody who, who says to you there is no such thing as objective truth, that nothing is true. And, of course, what's the question you ask for that? Is that true? Is that statement true? Because if that statement is true, then, of course, then there is objective truth, right? If that statement is false, then there is truth. Either way, there is truth. You can't deny truth and expect that your statement be regarded as true if, indeed, there is nothing that is true. It is the same way here with the idea of, of everything being vanity and then looking for an advantage. It, it is where men are driven to because everything is vain. I have to just do what's best for me because ultimately nothing else is meaningful. So I just have to go for the gold for my own sake and live for today and for me alone. That's where men are driven to act and behave that way. And that's why they do that. But it's ultimately a self-contradictory notion to do so because the idea of advantage or profit only makes sense in, an, in, in a world in which one thing is more meaningful than another, in which one thing is better than another, objectively so. So I can't, I can't pursue something that is a profit or advantage to me unless I am first able to recognize that at least this thing is more meaningful than this thing. This thing is better, greater than this. But in a world where everything is utterly meaningless, can you ever really say that anything is better than anything else? No, you cannot. So in a world that is filled with vanity, in a world that is vanity of vanities, we can't even evaluate what is even to our own profit. That is utter despair. And that's where this worldview leads. That's where Solomon's worldview left him. Utter and total despair. Because it's completely contradictory. To even pursue, and that's what I have to do. I have to pursue my own advantage. But I can't even evaluate advantage if indeed everything is vanity. So I go back to it being vanity of vanities. It's all vanity. And even when I begin to pursue what I think might be to my advantage, I have to recognize even that I can't really say is to my advantage because nothing is truly advantageous if everything is meaningless. If everything is useless, nothing is useful. If everything under the sun is all that there is, then everything under the sun is really nothing. Speaking of advantage, you and I have an advantage over Solomon an advantage that Solomon did not have. And that is that we read his words from the perspective of understanding God's redemptive plan in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Solomon lived a thousand years before that was revealed. We live 2,000 years after that is revealed. And so we have the advantage of being able to evaluate Solomon's words, not from the perspective of one who was just under the sun and under that curse, but from the perspective of, of, of people who have been delivered from under, life under the sun. Because we recognize that in order to deliver the children of men who live life under the sun, that God sent His Son, born of a virgin, and He lived in this world under the sun. He worked and toiled under the sun. He suffered and died under the sun, and He rose again under the sun. In order that He might deliver us from the curse of living life under the sun. And so it would be wrong for us as New Testament believers to read the book of Ecclesiastes from the perspective of one who is forced to share Solomon's perspective. Because we can't do that. We have to read Ecclesiastes from the vantage point of one who has been delivered from Solomon's perspective. We've been taken out of life under the sun 
And we are not able to evaluate life in any other way than from above the sun, looking down from God's perspective with God's wisdom. And so we would have sympathy and empathy for men like Solomon who see all of life as vanity. But we have an answer to the vanity, don't we? And we know something that Solomon didn't. And that is that Christ lived and died for us. And what is it that makes this world vain, empty, and meaningless? What is it that strikes this this chord in our world that we do all that we do and it just seems to be uselessness and meaninglessness and futility over and over again? What is it that has caused that in our world? It's nothing less than sin. It's because we live in a Genesis 3 world. It's because we live under the curse. And so as Romans 8 says, God has subjected this world to futility in hopes that eventually it will be liberated from that. One of these days we will live in a kingdom where everything is not vanity, where everything is not vain, where that perspective won't even make sense because we will view everything from God's perspective because of what he has done for us in the person of Christ. So that's how we have to view Ecclesiastes. You and I can understand and sympathize with that perspective because we have probably been there at some point in your life. We can see that. We understand the the disparity of it. We understand the emptiness of it. But we've been delivered from it because of what God has done for us in Christ his son. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, we thank you that you have delivered us from this world and from life just under the sun. Thank you that you've given us your word and given us a perspective on all things. We know the truth of all things because you have revealed it in Scripture. You've given to us everything that we need for life and for godliness. You have, you have blessed us with your wisdom and your truth regarding this life and the life to come. And we pray that you would help us to evaluate our lives and all that we do from your perspective and to, to get your perspective and understand how meaningful it is because you are in the equation. And give us grace to understand this perspective that we might reach out to those who are lost in this disparity and share with them what you have done for those who are under the sun. We thank you in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.